we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Wayne Eskridge. I'm the uh, founder and CEO and first patient of the uh, Fatty Liver Foundation and wanted to welcome you all here. And what we'll be doing today is <clears throat> we'll be talking about the other pandemic. You know, NAFLD NASH is a silent epidemic that so many people don't know about and yet it is it will in the end it will kill more people than COVID-19 did it'll just that it's going to take it 15 or 20 years to do it so it's a very very serious uh, public health problem and something that our society is uh, needing to engage in and so we're Happy to welcome to you to this discussion, and we'll be talking about some of the tools that are coming down the road to, uh, to help, uh, help us solve this problem. So next slide. Oh, you've already got my picture there. Well, let's go to the next one. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce Jane Pan and uh, pass it to her for a few minutes to talk about uh, her role in this. Thank you very much, Wayne. And um, thank you very much for organize, organize this uh, uh, webinar. And um, as you mentioned, it's, it's a really um, a public health issue that it's going to affect a lot of people. And that is also very personal with me. Um, I was diagnosed with uh, NASH about five years ago. And, um, and, and just that was just by chance. And, um, and since then, I have joined some research pro pro uh, protocols uh, at the local Innova Hospital. And, um, and then um, there was no medication, no instructions or anything, but they did this, do some fiber scan for me. Um, but then that was the end of that. And every year when I go for a uh, physical and um, <clears throat> I would tell my doctor that, you know, I've been diagnosed with NASH. And then, so the doctor would just not and just say, um, and, and say nothing, you know? And so, so but, um, but this is a big, big problem um, um, for, for everybody. It, it does not discriminate and it's, it's um, for, and for all ages too. And um, well, happy NASH day. I hope that, you know, some, sometime soon, then it's, NASH is gonna be recognized. Thank you, Wayne. Oh, thanks, Jane. And I'd like to pass this to Amy, who's actually going to be our uh, moderator today and uh, get this program underway. Well, thank you, Wayne. Um, thank you for having us here today and organizing <laughs> this for International NASH Day. So welcome, everybody, for um, joining us um, today. And we have some exciting things to go over. But first, Let's go over some disclosures and disclaimers. So I'm gonna read this um, for those who might be on the call uh, and not uh, viewing their camera, they might be calling in, but this is our disclosure and disclaimer statements. Uh, disclosure of unlabeled use. This community educational activity may contain discussion of published and or investigational uses of agents and diagnostics, that are not indicated by the U.S. Food and a, a Drug Administration, FDA. The planners of this activity do not recommend the use of any agent and diagnostics outside of the labeled indications. The opinions expressed in this community educational activity are those of the panelists and do not necessarily represent the views of the Fatty Liver Foundation and Hepatitis B Initiative of Washington, D.C. Please refer to the official prescribing information for each product for discussion of approved indication, contradiction or contradictions and warnings. Disclaimer, participants have an implied responsibility to use the newly acquired information to enhance their own personal and or professional development. The information presented in this educational activity is not meant to serve as a guideline for patient 
self-management or patient management by healthcare professionals. Any procedures, medications, or other courses of diagnosis or treatment discussed or suggested in this activity should not be used by patients without consultation with their medical providers, as well as by clinicians without evaluation of their patient's conditions and possible contraindications and or dangers in use. Review of any applicable manufacturer's product information and comparison with recommendations of other authorities. And this webinar is being recorded, so it could be broadcast at later usage. Next slide. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Niraj Nisri. He's the Chief Medical Officer at the Fatty Liver Foundation. Dr. Mistry is a public health physician with wide ranging experience in HIV AIDS and neglected tropical diseases, um, having served as the managing director of the Global Network for Neglected Tropical Diseases. He brings extensive global health policy and programming experience, um, having worked in both the public and private sectors in clinical practice, health policy, and social development. Prior to accepting a position teaching at Georgetown University, he was engaged by the National Health Services in London and with Merck. Uh, he was a founding member of the Global Business Coalition on HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. He worked with the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief and the Global Fund, where he continues to support the Technical Review Panel. So welcome, Dr. Mystery. Thank you, Amy and uh, Jane and Wayne uh, for hosting this and always good to be um, engaging and interacting with you. Um, so today I'm going to just cover a 101 on NAFLD and NASH. And I want to also acknowledge that um, as patient advocates, we strongly support our patients uh, and our community getting more involved in the science. And that's certainly happening with uh, many of um, uh, supporters and followers of the Fatty Liver Foundation. So do forgive me if I'm covering a lot of information that you know already, and I'm also going to make it, uh, cover it in very accessible terms for people who might be new to the subject. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to get that balance right. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Um, so um, overall, the worldwide prevalence of NASH is increasing and, and NAFLD is increasing. Now, let me go into the, the two uh, acronyms. So NAFLD is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and NASH is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So previously, the, the number one cause of liver-related fat deposition, that's fat accumulating in the liver, used to be alcohol use related. And over the years, what we've seen is, um, while there has been some stabilization, and if not in some parts of the world, reduction in alcohol intake, what we're seeing is that the rates of fatty liver disease increasing, not related to alcohol. And this is what non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is. Um, and it is associated with many risk factors that predispose the liver to develop uh, and, and accumulate flat fat in the cells of the liver. And what happens is these cells, uh, so in the normal liver, we have just the normal liver cells going about their function. And then we have fatty liver disease, which, uh, 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 in which the, fat, uh, the liver cells start literally getting fat because of the accumulation of fat in them. And this causes a ballooning of the cells to the point that it irritates the liver tissue. And sometimes these fat cells actually burst open. And when they burst open and they release their contents in the tissue of the liver, it causes an irritation which results in inflammation. And you know that anytime you get cut or is there some sort of inflammation, a scab forms, which is fibrosis. And it's exactly what happens in the liver. When there's inflammation, uh, the liver starts scabbing itself and forms fibrosis. Now, this fibrosis is not typical of how the liver cell is supposed to function. And over time, this fibrosis can lead to cirrhosis and can lead to liver cancer. Now, the good thing about all of this, despite how terrible it sounds, 
is that not everyone who accumulates fat in their liver will develop NASH and not everyone who develops NASH will develop fibrosis and not everyone who develops fibrosis will develop cirrhosis. That said, we don't know who will actually go down that path. And so our job as healthcare professionals and public health physicians is to reduce the likelihood of any person going down that uh, uh, form of pathology to advanced disease. We are working to see if we can find genetic associations of uh, people who might be more at risk to actually develop that disease. So when we look at this disease, of the world's global population, which we now standing at about 6 billion people, we estimate there to be 25% of that population having some sort of fat accumulation in their liver. Um, and now, now, of those 25%, there's about 3 to 5% of the global population with, will then develop NASH. And this is where we start moving down the path of advancing pathology. So it's still small in terms of the overall population of the world, uh, a proportion of the uh, population of the world. But in absolute terms, of the 6 billion people, it is a significant number of people. And just by comparison, uh, you know, 3% or 5% of 6 billion people is about 300 million people, right? Um, and, and not too many people have heard of NASH or NAFL. Yet, Everyone's heard of HIV, and the number of people living with HIV in the world is estimated to be about 35 million people. So 35 million people, and everyone knows about these uh, uh, about HIV, and yet three to 400 million people living with some sort of fatty liver disease, and not too many people know about it. And so we have to shout out loud about this disease. And so of those people developing NASH, progressing to cirrhosis is a very small proportion. But when it uh, progresses to uh, fibrosis and cirrhosis, that's when it is actually very severe disease and it's a life-threatening condition. Uh, next slide, please. So that's sort of the global overall prevalence. When we look at the United States, and one of the challenges we have in the United States is that it is one of the leading cause, uh, uh, leading uh, prevalences of, um, of the comorbidities, that is the diseases that lead to NAF, NASH and NAFLD. And those diseases are diabetes, uh, particularly type 2 diabetes, which is associated uh, very strongly with obesity and, uh, um, and, and being overweight. And in the United States, the, the last state of uh, obesity report uh, showed a prevalence of 43% adult uh, prevalence of uh, obesity. So that is huge and that number is increasing. What is also frightening is childhood obesity is on the increase and currently that level is about 18%. So this is all the pipeline for developing fatty liver disease. Uh, we'll go into the other risk factors, but the prevalence of NAF, uh, NAFLD, that is just having fat in the liver uh, in the United States, is at 34%. And from our previous slide, comparing to the global uh, prevalence, that was 25%. So certainly uh, a, a magnitude higher uh, in the United States. And of that, the prevalence of NASH in the general population is 3 to 4%. Um, and of those NASH K, uh, uh, patients with uh, uh, fatty liver disease, 21% of those have uh, uh, NASH. That's on the path to developing cirrhosis uh, and fibrosis. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this, this slide is important because between the years of 2007 and 2010, there was a 12% prevalence of NASH and fibrosis uh, was about 2% in the population. From 2015 to 2018, the prevalence of NASH increased from 12% to 14%. But the prevalence of fibrosis went up from 2% to 6%. And when you look at the fact that 
um, uh, fibrosis is uh, uh, one fifth or one sixth of the total proportion of NASH cases uh, between 2007 and 2010. And between 2015 and 2018, it becomes almost half the prevalence of NASH. What we're seeing is that more patients or more people are moving down the path of advanced disease. And that is worrying because that is telling us that those risk factors that gave them fatty liver disease are actually still there, if not intensifying. And so we're not doing a good job in diagnosing NASH, and we're not doing a, a, a good job in removing those risk factors, if not those risk factors are exacerbating to move them faster down the path of more severe disease. So we have our work cut out for us. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, uh, we touched on this, but I just wanted to go this into this in a bit more detail. The um, different organizations, the American Association for the Study of Liver uh, Disease, the American Diabetes Association, um, uh, et cetera, uh, have different criteria that they use to classify the risk factors for NASH. But overall, uh, type 2 diabetes is one of the highest associations uh, in being a causative factor for developing NASH and NAFLD. Increasing age is also another risk factor and metabolic syndrome. And metabolic syndrome is a collection of different uh, factors, which include um, uh, high cholesterol, uh, uh, hypertension uh, or high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, etc. So uh, syndrome is a collection of different factors. Um, that lead to a particular disease outcome. And so uh, you can see that is also quite big. Um, and then elevated ALT, and this is one of the liver enzymes, which is a very non-specific indicator of some sort of liver dysfunction. So if there's anything suggestive of a liver dysfunction, like an altered liver enzyme, that may also be a risk factor. Each of these on their own, apart from type 2 diabetes, which is a very high correlation to fatty liver disease, each of these on their own doesn't uh, ring an alarm to say, oh my God, this person has uh, fatty liver disease or NASH. But as a collection, what we're finding uh, um, is, is that it points to uh, a high indicator of there being NAFLD or NASH. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is the gathering storm or the tsunami that we talk about, okay? So because there's a lack of knowledge about these diseases, it is flying under the radar. And when you heard from Jane and from Wayne, their stories on NASH was all an incidental finding. It wasn't an index of suspicion that their doctors had. It wasn't any symptoms they were experiencing. It was by chance that this disease was, uh, uh, was diagnosed. And, and so this is the big challenge that we have, where our health systems are not proactively screening for these diseases. Um, and and we, we, when we look at health systems, they're often reactive. They're reactive to patients coming to them, and then they respond to those patients. What we need to do, because our patients aren't experiencing these uh, uh, symptoms uh, of this disease, is we need to be proactively going out sensitizing, screening, and finding these patients. In uh, the other challenge that we face is that because um, there's no medicines that are approved or, or shown to be effective against these diseases, what's happening is the doctors aren't screening for them because they don't know what to do with their patients if they have these diseases. And, and, um, and NASH and NAFLD are the perfect storm of many comorbidities which exist in society today, the diabetes, the high cholesterol, the hypertension, uh, overweight and obesity. And so what we're gonna see is all of a sudden with an increased number, and we saw that with the advancing pathogenesis of this disease, there's gonna be more advanced disease. And we know that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, and, and so while prevention is going to cost so much less, treatment of these diseases, hospital costs, transplant costs, uh, ICU uh, management is going to cost so much more further on down the line. Okay, uh, next slide, please. 
So this is the challenge that we face, and this is the partnership that uh, the Fatty Liver Foundation is exploring with HBIDC, where we have to proactively go out to communities and screen. And the way we do that is through these particular types of screening um, uh, uh, interventions. And we'll hear more about that uh, later on in this webinar. So before, the way we diagnosed fatty liver disease uh, or any form of fibrosis or cirrhosis was literally sticking a long needle, it's about 20 centimeters long, into the liver of a patient and getting a liver biopsy. Now, with advanced disease and depending on what type of disease we're looking for and the staging, a liver biopsy may be indicated. But what the good news is, is that this, uh, the, the types of tests that we have now are non-invasive tests, and they are showing a very, very high degree of correlation with um, what used to be the gold standard, the liver biopsy. In fact, some of the non-invasive tests are actually showing better sensitivity and specificity for fatty liver disease and NASH. Now, sensitivity and specificity are two really nerdy terms we use in the biomedical community. Um, sensitivity is essentially telling us how good is it at picking up some sort of disease in the community. And that is a very good test for screening of disease. Specificity tells us how uh, specific the test is for the disease condition and how good is it at staging the condition, not just telling us is the disease present, but how advanced the disease is. And we have simple tests like these blood tests, uh, FIB4, uh, NAFIL, uh, fibrosis score, uh, and, and uh, platelet ratios, where these are routine tests that are done um, when you go for your annual physical or checkup, but they are uh, uh, worked in a certain formula to give us some sort of indicator to say, hey, you know what, this may be a high risk uh, for liver disease. Then we have other tests, these proprietary tests, which are now much more advanced and they use big data analytics that take reams and reams and reams of tests and data. And that tells us a pattern that emerges and that pattern becomes predictive to say who might be at risk. Um, interesting point though as well, is that the way the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration used to assess tests, now they have to find new ways of assessing tests based on data, as opposed to um, uh, looking at uh, 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 the actual test results uh, that come out from like biopsies. And then we've also moved into a realm of uh, elastography. And I'm not going to steal the thunder from my colleagues on uh, the webinar. I'm going to let them go into this. But these are imaging tests that pick up different uh, types of patterns on imaging on um, uh, through ultrasound devices uh, and, and different types of waves. Uh, and they'll go into all of that. It's absolutely painless uh, and there's no breach of the skin or getting into the person. Uh, but we're fortunate that over the past five years, all these tests have come uh, to the fore. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, and now the most important thing, what do we do about all of this? Um, and so uh, lifestyle modification still remains the mainstay of intervention when it actually comes to NASH uh, and NAFLD uh, to the extent that patients like Wayne have actually reversed their conditions um, and, uh, and, and fibrosis. And this is through diet, physical activity, uh, good control, of uh, uh, um, um, their diabetes, uh, cholesterol, hypertension, and all those comorbidities, and weight loss, weight loss, weight loss um, uh, is really, really important. Um, and to the extent that bariatric surgery has become an important intervention for those who have challenges with weight loss. Reduction of cardiovascular disease. And once again, this is controlling all those risk factors of metabolic syndrome. Um, um, just an important point on this. It's almost become normalized in society now that people will develop diabetes. Um, you know, many a community we've engaged with, engaged with, people have said, well, I don't have diabetes yet. 
Uh, and it was almost an expectation that they will develop it because their brother, sister, uncle, aunt, mom, dad had diabetes. And, and what we found is when we introduce a new pathology like NASH or NAFL or fatty liver disease, there's a, a heightened sense of awareness of their health uh, because it's not normalized. And we find that it may have an impact in their better management of these other diseases. I'm not going to go too much into the medications. A lot of these are still experimental and have to be done in conjunction with the lifestyle modification and behavior change. Even if we had an effective therapy against NASH and NAFL tomorrow, we still have to do the lifestyle interventions because they have a greater impact on uh, halting or if not reversing the disease progression. Uh, so all that said, um, uh, while it feels like this is uh, uh, sort of an inevitable advancing pathology with the appropriate intervention, support and care at the household level, as well as uh, 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 with communities of patients, we find that we can actually reverse this disease and, and manage it appropriately. So I know that was a lot of information. These slides will be made available and we're always happy to take questions at the Fatty Liver Foundation. Over to you, Amy. Great, thank you, Dr. Mystery. Um, thank you for giving us a 101 on NAFLD and NASH. Um, I want to encourage everyone to use the Q&A function on Zoom. It's at the bottom of your screen next to the chat box. Um, if you have any questions for Dr. Mystery, please put it in there. We will address all the Q&As at the end of our presentations when all of our panelists have an opportunity to speak. So now we're going to get into the next section talking about non-invasive screening tools. Um, we have three presentations. We're gonna kick it off with Wayne. Um, so Wayne is going to uh, lead us in a, 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 a um, learning opportunity about EchoSense and FibroScan. Wayne? Thanks, Amy. <laughs> a little bit of background. <clears throat> when we decided as a foundation to study this problem, <clears throat> we did it under uh, uh, the, what we call the Sun One study. <clears throat> and the only tool <clears throat> that was available at that time, <clears throat> you left, excuse me, we have a lot of pollen going on right now. <clears throat> and I seem to have had an attack here. Um, but the, the only non-invasive uh, non, uh, test that we had available to us was the um, fiber scan by Equisense. And that's a very, that was a breakthrough technology for the field because it was a portable device, which we were able to take out into the field. And it's, you know, completely painless. It's uh, quick, it, but it provides the important measurements of the physical characteristics found in the liver. And it gave us an opportunity to identify people that were at risk. So uh, give me the next slide, please. What, uh, because it's a, it's a, a more mature technology <clears throat> and we have some, one of the purposes of the uh, webinar today is to acquaint people with the new things that are coming down the road. And uh, these are um, a project by Sonic Insights and Escopics. These are two devices that uh, have really been coming on since the development of FibroScan. So we're gonna play just a short video about, uh, about FibroScan because it's, it's a few years old now and, and a lot more people know about it, but this will give you a, a big overview and give us time to delve into the newer technologies uh, in a little more depth. So Gabriella, could you? Can you hear it? No. Okay, one second, sorry. Prior to the exam. We can hear it, but it was very faint. Oh, okay, one second. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
always technical things, right? Yeah. <laughs> so bear with us for just a minute here. We'll get this going. Is that better? Here is Mr. Powell, who has a liver examination with FibroScan today. Yes. Prior to the examination, Mr. Powell has a few questions. FibroScan is the gold standard non-invasive solution for a comprehensive management of liver health. It is called non-invasive as nothing enters your body. FibroScan sends a pulse of energy to your liver which will give your doctor important information about your liver's health. Wear comfortable clothes that allow access to the right side of your rib cage. You should be fasting for at least three hours before your examination. The examination is carried out by a trained operator, doctor, nurse, technician. You will lie on your back with your right arm above your head and cross right leg on the left to help open the rib spaces. Gel will be applied and the probe placed between your rib spaces. No, it doesn't hurt. FibroScan is painless. You may feel a slight vibration from the probe as the measurements are taken. A FibroScan examination typically takes five to 10 minutes to perform. <clears throat> so the, um, that, that's just a really quick look at uh, FibroScan. There are quite a few offices around the country now who have this, although it's still primarily in the hands of the hepatologists and the uh, few of the gastro docs, but it's not particularly uh, available to typical primary care. And it's uh, one of the, one of our, our particular missions and in the Fatty Liver Foundation is to encourage the adoption of uh, easier to use and cheaper and uh, more effective tools for identifying um, liver conditions in the, in the asymptomatic populations. The next slide. So when we did the uh, we did the Sun One study, we found that uh, we were able using this this portable device to uh, identify uh, people fairly readily, provide some immediate information to them, and uh, we identified a significant number of people in the in the population that had a, had no idea that they had liver disease. Next slide. So <laughs> when we, as we think about how the tooling evolves, one of the next ones that's, you know, became visible to us in the market uh, was, was Sonic Insights. And I'd like to just turn this over to Elaine, who is going to give us a little information about Sonic Insights, which is, uh, you know, really one of the next steps in, uh, in non-invasive uh, portable uh, testing. So thank you. Thank you, Wayne. I'd like to introduce um, Elaine Wandler uh, from Sonic Insights. She's the Director of uh, Corporate Development. And also her colleague, Emily Kramer, who's a clinical trainer and support specialist. So a little bit about Elaine. Um, she's a senior executive and entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience gained in a variety of settings from multinationals to SMEs to nonprofits, spanning uh, corporate and brand marketing communications, strategic planning, stakeholder engagement, program and entrepreneur development, um, a results-oriented strategic thinker with strong leadership, analytical, and interpersonal skills, she is. 
as well as her colleague, um, Elaine, uh, Emily. Emily is a licensed radiologic technologist with numerous awards for um, her pat patient care techniques. She prides herself on striving to give every patient the best care possible. Um, her colleagues recognize her for her direct yet kind communication with clear expectations. She's able to adapt seamlessly to the needs of her training participants in order to ensure everyone is able to understand, use, and connect with the presented materials. So she also graduated from Cooper University Hospital and Camden County College with an associate um, degree in health sciences. She holds a bachelor's degree from Widener University in Allied Health with a really high GPA of 4.0. <laughs> and additionally, she's a member of the ARRT and ASRT. Um, and she's been also a long-term member of SAG. So welcome Elaine and Emily. Thanks, Amy. Um, you did some good digging on background information there. Thanks for the kind words. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Wayne and his team, as well as HPI DC for the opportunity to present to you Bellicur, which is one of the newest non-invasive imaging tasks available to help diagnose and manage chronic liver disease. You know, we're certainly happy to support the Fatty Liver Foundation as we share in their mission to raise awareness about NAFLD and NASH and the importance of early diagnosis. And I have to apologize, I too have a scratchy voice. Um, all right, next slide, please. I'll start by telling you a little bit about our company. Um, actually, you can go to the next slide as well. Sonic Insights was founded approximately five years ago based on technology discovered at the University of British Columbia up here in Vancouver, Canada. And our mission is to develop non-invasive diagnostic and monitoring tools that are accurate, accessible, affordable, and easy to use. Our first product is Velocur, and it's this liver health assessment solution that can be used to manage fatty liver disease by providing measurements of, of liver elasticity or stiffness, which of course indicates the fibrosis that Dr. Misty was talking about, and attenuation, which indicates how much fat or also called steatosis is in the liver. Next slide, please. So Velocur is the first 3D handheld tissue assessment tool, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. It's an ultrasound based solution that incorporates some of the technology principles found in MRE or magnetic resonance elastography. It's been cleared by the FDA for the management of chronic liver disease and is now commercially available in the United States and is being used by both research and clinical centers. It's a portable system and it consists of an activation and control units, an ultrasound probe and a laptop computer that contains the Velocur software. Next step, uh, slide. There are three basic steps to how Velocur works. In the top picture, you'll see what we call an activation pad or unit that's placed under the patient's back. This unit gently vibrates, which creates waves through the liver, which are then measured by ultrasound as shown in the middle picture. The results are immediate and provide measurements of liver elasticity and attenuation, which I mentioned earlier, are surrogate measurements for fibrosis and fat. Next slide, please. To give you just a little bit more background on how the technology actually works, like other types of elastography imaging, such as the fiber scan that, that Wayne was telling you about, Bellicur is based on the fact that these waves travel at different speeds through tissue, depending on how stiff it is. So for example, waves travel slower in softer, healthier tissue and faster and stiffer fibrotic tissue. These waves are then measured using the ultrasound probe. So what are the features that make Bellicur work so well? As you saw on the previous slide, like MRE, the waves are created using an external excitation unit. And that allows for the creation of steady state waves, which means that they're constant throughout the entire liver. This is in contrast to other systems that generate the wave from the probe through a pulse. And in that case, the wave only goes through a section of the liver. We also activate the waves using four different frequencies, which is another way to eliminate potential errors that could be caused by artifacts that might interfere with an accurate wave measurement if only one, a single frequency was used. Further, the steady state shear waves, having them travel throughout the entire organ, 
allows for a much deeper measurement, which means greater accuracy on patients that may have a high body mass index. Next slide, please. The actual ultrasound scan is done with a sweeping motion that allows for a volumetric measurement, hence the three-dimensional tissue sampling. As you can imagine, sampling a big volume of tissue should also contribute to much better accuracy for both measurements of stiffness and fat. And a final benefit is among the entire scan, which you can see on the screen, you can actually choose the best region on which to calculate the measurements with the touch of a finger. Next slide, please. So I've explained um, why Bellicure is accurate. Oops, there it is. Okay, yeah, you can just run through them all. Um, why it's accurate, its other benefits include accessibility, it's portable, it fits into its own briefcase and can be set up at point of care wherever there is a patient bed. It's affordable, there's no large capital cost, it's just a monthly subscription. It doesn't require a radiologist or physician to use it, it can be administered by a nurse or medical assistant. And when someone is proficient with it, the test is under 10 minutes. And this is why we think Bellicure has an important role to play in the management of liver disease. Now to show you how you could become proficient at it, for those of you that may end up using it in screening studies down the road, I'd like to introduce you to Emily Kramer. First, we'll show you a short video of the procedure on an actual human, and then Emily will talk briefly about what's involved in learning how to do a Bellicure scan. You can go ahead and run the video. Thank you. Hi everyone. So that was just a quick overview of how a patient study with Bellicor is performed. And with proper training, Bellicor can be done efficiently and quickly. And that's where I come in. Each trainee must complete a roughly 30, or excuse me, a roughly 90 minute online training before having a two half day training session with me. We begin day one with an overview of the system, practice with a liver phantom and practice with each other and office staff. Day two, we focus on lots more practicing using volunteers on site or even patients for a range of body types. Our additional support includes regular reports for quality assurance and real-time technical support, but I'll go into detail about that in just a moment. You can go ahead onto the next slide. The procedure, as you saw in the video, is quite simple. You start by palpating to find the best rib space before you place your probe onto the patient. Use your ultrasound probe to visualize the ideal liver image, and you begin your sweep by instru instructing the patient to hold their breath for roughly eight seconds. And then you sweep the probe in a nice smooth manner, and magically you have your picture. Go ahead on to the next slide. After each sweep, you can see your results in real time. So the left side of your screen, you can see the current information for the previous sweep, including reliability for the accuracy of that particular sweep, along with the image below. Previously performed sweeps are displayed as overall results on the right side of the screen, 
and they use a medium to provide detailed information about what you're looking at. You can go on. We here at Velicor are here to support you throughout your journey. We know that learning new technology can feel overwhelming, and we want to make sure that you are confident and able to provide your patients with the care that they deserve. After the in-person training, we are able to assist you remotely. So while you perform your scans with your patient, we can access your computer and give you pointers along the way. We provide monthly scan reviews to go over your progress, both via email and during Zoom calls, so we can discuss things in a more detailed format. We are always available via phone, by, via phone for those moments when you need us immediately. We provide a newsletter right to your inbox with additional tips or reminders. And of course, we are always striving to keep our trainings and technology current and cutting edge. We are consistently working behind the scenes to bring you better technology to improve your accuracy. So thank you everyone for your time and attention. And a big thank you again to the FLF team for hosting and back to you, Amy. Great, thank you, Emily, and thank you, Elaine. Um, I would like to next introduce um, Joel Gay from eScopics. Um, he is the product manager at eScopics. Um, he's a very experienced clinical manager with a demonstrated history of working directly or indirectly with the medical device industry. Joel is skilled in endovascular devices, medical ultrasound, imaging devices, clinical data management, and healthcare. He has strong scientific and communication, uh, and he's also a professional with a master's of science focused in economic intelligence and science and healthcare, scientific and medical communication, as well as a uh, master's of science in developmental genetics and cellular biology. So very experienced individual. I look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, it was really a nice introduction. I've never, I have, I've never had that one, one like this before, uh, uh, to be honest. Uh, so thank you very much for the organizers of this uh, uh, meeting, uh, the, the Fatty Liver Foundation and your partner. It's really, it's really uh, a, a nice opportunity for us to be able to present there. Um, and you can go to the next slide, maybe, uh, Gabriella. So what, what I will present you, I'm from the company Iscopix, uh, the product manager. And what I will present you is what we believe is really a nice tool uh, using ultrasound that can be used for the massive screening of NAFLD NASH patients at, at the point of care, meaning where the patients are. Uh, before they can go uh, to the hepatologist because they have signs of advanced disease. Uh, next slide. So the philosophy of the work we do at Iscopics is to bring ultrasound tools uh, to their utmost democratization possible by making them accessible as software services for any healthcare professionals uh, and we believe that we are leading the, uh, what we think is the ultimate digital transformation of ultrasound, uh, where finally software is able to replace most of the hardware that exists in big ultrasound systems. And when, when we, we like to take this uh, example of the uh, uh, camera and photography industry, where finally the uh, software has replaced most of the big hardware uh, uh, camera uh, systems uh, that were requiring expertise to be used to make an image good enough to be nice or beautiful or whatever. Uh, uh, and when you, when you look at what, it, what is available today on the smartphones, for example, there is basically no more hardware, no more focus to be done, no more settings of the imaging. You just take a picture and it's nice because of, because of, of, of the software. And this is exactly what we intend to uh, uh, make possible for ultrasound uh, diagnostic tools. Next slide. So the hepatoscope, we believe, is really a bedside ultra-portable ultrasound system that provides all ultrasound tools that have been correlated to some extent for the non-invasive liver assessment. And as you see on the picture here, uh, uh, on the right-hand side, there is one probe. Uh, because we do ultrasound, you still need a probe to be put 
placed on, 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 a, on a patient, uh, obviously to get an image. Uh, and then there is a software running on the PC, uh, on a laptop, for example, in that, in that image. Next slide. This product, the, the hepatoscope, uh, is made of one probe, as I told you. Uh, that's a proprietary probe. And this probe has inside it, at the back of it, one mechanical vibrator that is able to reproduce the same vibration that exists in FibroScan probe. It's a 50 hertz vibration. Uh, uh, but we are also doing imaging because it's an ultrasound imaging probe. So we are able to extract much more data from the image than FibroScan can do. Uh, and there is a software, the hepatoscope software, which is uh, compatible with uh, most of the high powered uh, off the shelf laptops that exist in the market with uh, uh, GPUs, for example. Next uh, slide. So this is how the user interface is presented. I'm not going to spend too much time because we will have a demo afterwards. Uh, you have two modes to use the system. One mode, I don't know if you see my, my pointer here on the image. Uh, but there is one mode here on the left hand side that assesses tissue stiffness uh, with a 50 hertz vibration transient elastography, except we do it in 2D, so we are able to reconstruct an image of tissue stiffness. And then on the, on the right hand side, you have uh, uh, the other modality which enables to re retrieve two parameters that are correlated to steatosis, which is ultrasound attenuation and speed of sound. Next slide. Next slide, thank you. At the end of the exam, you have the three parameters that are measured, stiffness, attenuation, ultrasound attenuation, sorry, and speed of sound. And these three parameters help the clinicians to have a complete or more complete understanding of what's going on in the patient's liver. Next slide. The hepatoscope, he has been demonstrated to be substantially equivalent to FabriScan and to other premium diagnostic ultrasound devices. Okay, uh, we, we talk about the big ultrasound uh, diagnostic uh, systems available most of the time in, in, in the radiology departments. Uh, and it's uh, uh, because of this, of this uh, substantially, uh, of this substantial equivalence, sorry. It has been cleared by the FDA uh, to be to be commercialized uh, since January 2022, and we have we have this uh, the CE file that's been filed. Uh, it was in April, uh, and we expect to get the CE mark before the end of the year. Next slide. We have uh, been running a clinical investigation with the University Hospital in Bordeaux in France. Uh, with a well-known professor, Victor de Lidingan. This investigation is ongoing, but I'm really excited to show you these preliminary results here on 32 patients over a target of 100 patients. And you see that the uh, measurements of stiffness we do with FibroScan versus the hepatoscope are very, very well correlated. Uh, uh, and this, if confirmed, will be uh, highly substantial for, the, for, the, for, 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 its, for its clinical use. Next slide. The hepatoscope proposes ultrasound as services, as I was telling you, uh, for large-scale screening of nafl uh, And it can target different users. We think about the pharmaceutical industry. We think about the uh, clinical, the clinicians, diabetology, primary care physicians, community practice as well, and obviously the, the hepatology specialists as well. Next slide. Thank you for your attention. I think now we're going to move to the uh, demo. Uh, and so before doing the demo, I'm just showing you here the probe uh, that, I, that I'm handling in my hand. So this is the probe I'm going to use. I'm going to use it on a, on, a, on, a, on a model that is just here. And Gabriella, I will need to share my screen if you don't mind. Sure thing. You should be able to now. Yep. So I'm sharing my screen. I am changing my camera. So now you should see here our model with the uh, uh, right uh, rib cage facing me. I will launch uh, the app. So do, do you see the software app now on the image? Yeah. OK, good. So I'm logging in. Sorry for my password.
it should be okay. It's not okay. <laughs> we present it. There we go. So we lost the camera. There we go. Okay. So this is the, the page where the clinician enters the patient's information. I'm going to go very quickly here. Then the user selects liver exam, and you see an ultrasound image here on the screen. I'm putting ultrasound gel on the probe, and I will position the probe over the patient's rib cage. Caution is called. So there we go. So you see the model liver here. You see the model is breathing. You can see the liver moving. I'm going to launch the first modality, which is shear wave elastography measurements. So we will measure the stiffness of the liver, and the probe will start will start vibrating, and we have nice reading of stiffness in the liver of this model. Oops, sorry, I'm losing the image here. And then when I think I'm in a good place. I can click on the save button and it will save automatically 10 measurements. And when it's done, the probe stops vibrating. And you see here the summary of the 10 measurements that I did on the user interface and the average stiffness value, the median, sorry, the median stiffness value of my series of 10 measurements. So I'm putting the probe again on this uh, model because I want to show you something else starting with stiffness again, and I would like to freeze here, for example, and save an image, which is done. Now I'm, I'm going out of this and going to quantitative ultrasound, which is the other modality that enables to measure attenuation and speed of sound at the same time on the same image, okay? So I'm gonna save here again, 10 measurements, when you see when some measurements become shadowed, it's because they are not supposed to be reliable by the system. Oops. Sorry, I lost some gel. There we go. There are too many vessels here. Trying another space. There we go. And we're done. So I did this exam. Oops, I can freeze here. I did this exam. I measured 10 values of stiffness, 10 values of ultrasound attenuation, and two times 10 values of speed of sound. And then when I'm done with this, I can click on end exam here, and I have reports. And these reports repeats all the measurements that I did. It can be printed in PDF. There are the images inside and all the values that I would take for this uh, patient. And then I click on print here, and it's done, and the exam is finished. So now I can stop sharing my screen and switch to the other camera. And I thank you for your attention with this. Great, that was very interesting. Thank you, Joel. Um, I'm going to remind everyone uh, to enter your questions that you may have in the Q&A section. And we're going to go ahead and start that Q&A section right now. So it's our fireside chat. I'm going to invite Wayne and Jane back. And Gabriella, if you could help um, uh, with this screen. <laughs> I do see a couple of questions in the Q&A. And as soon as I have Wayne and Jane back um, on our Zoom call, You're all I can there. address this. Okay. All right, so the first question is from Diana. How long did it take for Mr. Wayne 
to reverse his disease? Wayne, do you, uh, would you like to answer that? Sure. Um, I was diagnosed uh, using FibroScan in uh, January of 2015, and my score was 21.5. At that time, they were saying anything over 12 was considered cirrhosis. And um, by 2017, mid 2017, my score was under, uh, was, was in the tens. And uh, today my score is 9.6. So I basically got out of, um, <laughs> well, when I was diagnosed, I wasn't in liver hell, but I could see it from where I was. And uh, in 18 months, I had basically uh, reversed my situation to where I was an F3. And uh, then another year after that, uh, I got into the F2 space. And how, how did you do that, Wayne? Just out of curiosity. Uh, diet and exercise, lifestyle modification. Uh, when, when we got diagnosed with uh, cirrhosis, our, our doctor told us what we needed to do. My wife and I went home. We threw out everything in our pantry and refrigerator and we started over. And uh, we basically adopted a, a dietary uh, plan and... Uh, we, we worked at it and we paid attention to what we were supposed to do. And at my, uh, my heaviest weight, I weighed 210. I weigh 140 today, which is what I weighed when I graduated from high school. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Wayne. Um, Jane, did you want to add anything or comments on what Wayne was just sharing? How has your experience been um, once or uh, after you were diagnosed? What, what kind of lifestyle change have you experienced? Well, <clears throat> there was not much um, discussion among, our, among my doctors. And um, so it was not necessary to have any lifestyle change. Um, I mean, no instructions. And I think I'm in less than um, one. Um, and, um, and so um, I participated in the um, research program in, 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 in NOVA. And um, all they did was um, um, just take, take the fiber scan and, um, and ask a lot of questions, lifestyle questions. And um, so I think, I don't know what my status is right now, um, my doctors have no, no um, instruction or, or for me what to, what to do. So I think I'm in a mild, mild case. And so, but if I don't take care of it, you know, it will develop into stage, you know, different stages. Yeah. So I don't know what, what it is right now. Thank you, Jane. Thanks for sharing it. So it seems like, um, like Dr. Mystery was saying, this is uh, really one of those diseases or liver diseases that goes under the radar and there's not a lot of guidance or follow-up um, uh, and it's not consistent. So right. a lot of uh, attention and raising awareness needs to be done. Um, I see this, another question in our Q&A. Um, hi, Dr. Mystery. <coughs> I'm, uh, I'm, we'll be offering liver fast testing as a first line screening tool in the Hispanic Latino community. In their culture, they eat a lot of pastries like tortilla, uh, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce this, but is it flautus, uh, et cetera. I'm referring to clinical trials, but the ones that don't qualify, I would like to refer them somehow or to someone, a uh, dietitian preferred. Is this website in Spanish, offer free resources. Most of our clients are uninsured or underinsured. Thanks for the information. Dr. Mystery, are you available to address that? Uh, yes, absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. 
Um, uh, perfect. So um, we have, uh, uh, and I'll uh, put it in the chat now, uh, we have a site called the wellnessleague.org. Uh, and this is a site that has become an online community and is, is expanding as a much bigger online community where because there aren't treatments available and we know that lifestyle modification is critical to, uh, to uh, halting progress of liver disease as well as possibly reversing it as uh, Wayne's case. Um, and, and this is where people can get support through recipes and um, uh, exercise regimens and uh, weight loss uh, strategies, as well as a list of service providers of both community as well as medical care based on their zip code or where in the country they are. And we are certainly expanding. A lot of our materials have been translated into Spanish as well. Um, uh, and, and so the whole site is not translated at the moment, but there are resources that we will make available for Spanish speaking um, uh, patients and clients. Um, I want to refer to the, the liver fast test that Wayne brought, uh, Wayne Gosby in the, in the chat brought up. Um, that's one of the options of screening together with using imaging techniques, etc. And it depends on where the patient is. It depends who's running the screening program. But all of them are effective uh, in, in pointing in the right direction. The important thing, uh, and which, uh, which Jane alluded to, is the follow-up is really important. Um, knowing how the disease is uh, progressing, uh, making sure that it is being monitored. And if patients don't uh, um, get that type of uh, support from their general practitioner or family physician, they can always turn to this online resource and the Wellness League and, uh, and, and get further help there. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mistry. Um, I, might, I, um, I might just comment on the Wellness League if you've got a minute, Amy. Yes, of course. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a new project. Uh, well, it's not a new project, but it's just coming uh, to birth here uh, not right now. In fact, uh, today is the first time that this, uh, this version of the Wellness League has uh, seen the light of day. So it's, uh, it's early in the development of this. Uh, we invite you to uh, become a part of it. Uh, it will become uh, a very large resource. Right now, it's, uh, it's early days and uh, we have a lot of work to do, but we hope there's enough there for you now to... Uh, convince you to uh, participate with us uh, down the road and we invite you to become members. Great. Thank you, Wayne. Um, I do notice in the chat, there was a question from Diana. Are there any contraindications on using Velocure in patients with implantable devices? And Elaine did answer. Um, in terms of contraindications in patients with implantable devices, we can work with patients that are contraindicated uh, contra for MRI. It doesn't impact our readings, will likely depend on the type of the implant. Um, Elaine, did you want to uh, add anything else to that? If you're un, uh, if you want to unmute first, <laughs> thank you, Elaine. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I was going to say, go ahead, Emily. But I, I think in general, there it doesn't impact our readings. It shouldn't. The ultrasound shouldn't impact the devices. But we haven't done specific testing on that. So it. I think it really depends on the specific um, device that's implanted. Great. Thank you, um, Emily. Did you have anything to add? Or no, I was actually going to say similar. Um, you know, like she mentioned, we haven't done any specific studies, but ultrasound really shouldn't hurt any device like that. Mm -hmm. um, so for a lot of the contraindicated patients for MRIs, we are able to see those patients without an issue. So I don't think that it would be something that would hurt anything. But as she mentioned, we haven't done specific studies. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question I have in the Q&A box is, I am an OB and general ultrasound tech. We use the same 
a uh, probe to scan liver, kidney, pancreas, gallbladder, et cetera. What is the difference between the regular ultrasound or sonogram and this esco uh, escopic screening? Joel? So, yeah, yeah. So can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, there is no difference uh, in the way our probe is doing ultrasound imaging and has been cleared also by the FDA for its performance in doing ultrasound imaging. So it's really, uh, it's really a, an ultrasound imaging probe that has the capability of doing also stiffness imaging and retrieving other parameters. But it's an ultrasound imaging system that could be used for diagnostic ultrasound. Great, thank you, Joel. Um, I have another question here. Is there any specificities for the fatty liver diet or any diet to lose weight is sufficient, uh, please. Anyone want to no, touch that's that? That's probably me. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the the because everyone has a different uh, life, and we all have different likes and dislikes and and patterns. There isn't a one size fits all, really. But it's important to get the broad, uh, broad strokes of it right if you're battling liver disease. And the, there's a, the simplest diet that we can talk about is don't eat anything white. Don't eat salt, sugar, uh, potatoes, uh, white bread, rice. The issue is um, you don't want to have uh, a load of uh, carbohydrates and salt. And mm. we make up for that by increasing the amount of unsaturated fat and omega-3s. So striking a balance that suits your cultural, uh, your cultural food patterns is, is a journey that you know, everyone will take in a little bit different way. But the point is that you're trying to get uh, a diet that causes the least amount of work for your liver to do. And if you go to our website, uh, fattyliverfoundation.org, uh, we do have quite a bit of uh, diet-related information from our perspective. Now, other people talk about uh, various kinds of diets, but the key thing is uh, carbohydrates are not your friend and you know, sugar is not your friend and, and uh, minimize saturated fats in favor of unsaturated fats. Great, thank you, Wayne. Um, there was a question about where to find the link to access the Wellness League. It is in the chat box. Uh, so feel free to visit www.thewellnessleague.org for more information. I don't see any more questions in our Q&A box. Uh, if there's anybody else who would like to ask questions, please do so now. Otherwise, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Wayne and Jane for closing. Ah, there is another question. So I was told I am stage four NASH and have several other autoimmune illness, including diabetes. I already eat an extremely strict diet, under 35 carbs a day, rarely animal products, no processed and walk daily. What I consume obviously not affecting my liver either way. And the doctor says there is nothing further he can do for me. So what other options are there? So I guess this question is, what other things should uh, this person be aware of in terms of um, getting treatment or healing? Any advice? Ah, uh, well, we can't, can't really uh, do doctor things here. Uh, you're doing the the state of the art, basically, uh, if you are limiting your carbs and your the only question I would have, you know, I would take it up with your doctor as to what your balance of omega-3s, omega-6s is, 
and uh, whether or not uh, you should be having uh, a higher percentage of uh, unsaturated fats. But I would, would talk to the, your doctor about that. It's not the kind of a thing that we can, can uh, know about uh, in a webinar. Uh, but it is a challenge faced by people that have multiple uh, organ systems in play. It's, it's a very difficult uh, task to balance all that out. Thank you, Wayne. Um, there is another question here in the, the uh, Q&A box. I think this is a difficult question <laughs> to answer. It uh, says, why is it that this disease is of no interest to the medical community? Anybody <laughs> want to try to answer that? <laughs> uh, well, it, uh, doctors, doctors have a, we have a reactive medical system and if they, and they react to your symptoms. And if you first of all, don't have symptoms, you're not going to be in the crosshairs. And if they don't have anything they can do for you, uh, it's considered a waste of time to discover it yeah, particularly. So I think that we're caught in that, uh, in that trap of being largely asymptomatic and not having any treatments that doctors uh, are compensated to, to uh, deliver. Now, this... <laughs> We can do another webinar on this because it's vitally important to us as a fatty liver foundation that we change that because we need to address the social causes of these things and to intercept these diseases before they require the kind of high level care that doctors get paid for. And so the money that has gone into critical care needs to somehow uh, get shifted to, uh, into prevention uh, so that we don't have as much critical care and we have more uh, proactive uh, uh, community engagement. And that's really the, the province of the Sun studies is to uh, highlight the, the value of that and to identify those populations in the community that uh, are carrying these diseases around and, and they don't know it. And if we can get information to them at an earlier date, there's no reason in the world that they need to ever face a, uh, a serious disease like this for most people. And, and that's, that was the impetus for this webinar because what we've shown you is the evolving um, diagnostic equipment that's going to make it possible for us to more effectively be community-based and inexpensively intercepting these diseases so that uh, we can um, not be in a position where the first thing time you ever hear about NASH is when your doctor says you have cirrhosis and I'm sorry, we have no treatment. So you yeah, I kind of got on my soapbox there, but <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that, is, that, is our, that is the mission that uh, fundamentally we serve. Thank you. Does anybody else have a perspective they'd like to share? Why is it that this disease is of no interest to the medical community? Amy, I can share a little bit. Yes, Jane. So, um, it's of no interest because there's no money involved there right now. And I think lifestyle changes. And it's really difficult to do lifestyle change, changes in this country because the food, when I go to a food court in the shopping mall, there's, I, can't, I cannot find anything that I can eat. You know, I mean, even the salad bar is it's something that's not healthy. You know, so our food is killing us. And, and there's no money in the, medic, uh, in the um, medical field that 
that um, you know they're trying to develop a drug, and it actually it's just lifestyle changes, you know. But it's not our country. You know, this country is not supporting this lifestyle change. Thank you, Jing. Anyone else want to share their perspective? Any thoughts? All right, well, that ends the Q&A session. And I believe, Wayne, you have another slide that you would like to discuss. Gabriella? Well, I mentioned the, uh, the SUN program. Uh, I, we had talked about Sun One, which we completed, and uh, it's a series of, uh, of of programs which, with the goal of raising awareness and engaging people. Um, right now, we are uh, partnering with uh, Jane and and Amy and their group to do the first element of this of Sun 2, which is 20,000 patients in, around the country. And so they're, uh, they're going to be the pilot for, for the Sun 2 program. And uh, this is, we think, <clears throat> a, a critical step in, in stimulating the kind of change in society that we need. The goal ultimately of the Fatty Liver Foundation is to screen a million patients a year for liver disease. And that's going to take an enormous uh, amount of effort. But the SUN2 program is designed to provide proof of scalability and the uh, a value of, of uh, volume patient screening. And so it, uh, it's, it, it is an important, uh, we, we want to be an important voice <laughs> in the effort to change the way this country does manage diseases like NASH and the other non-communicable comorbidities that go with our defective uh, process of having food and, and the way we live. So I uh, really appreciate you taking your time with us today, but that's uh, that was all I had, and Amy. Thank you, Wayne. Um, so this concludes our webinar. I want to thank all of our panelists today, as well as our technical support team for putting together this wonderful webinar on International NASH Day. Thank you to our program participants and audience um, for the wonderful questions that you've posed for us. Um, please do continue to keep in touch. Um, there are additional information that you can learn from our websites. Uh, Gabriella, if you want to show the last slide, it has our um, uh, uh, yes, <laughs> our contact information. And uh, you could feel free to reach out to us to learn more about uh, what it is that we do and how we are tackling this uh, very critical liver disease to prevent liver cancer, of course. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>